Welcome to an online Bible study from Harbor Sight Baptist Church, a place of safety, rest, and resupply. We now join Pastor Arbuckle for this week's Bible study. You, you needed to get lost before you yeah. could get saved. And, and you, you had a head knowledge, but you understood you didn't have that, you didn't have that right. peace in your heart. You didn't have that relationship with the Lord. And I, I appreciate that testimony. I want to I wanna go back to 1 John 5.13. This question came up as far as the kind of knowledge, and I was mistaken. I was incorrect when I said that the word that is used in 1 John 5.13 uh, John is saying, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. That particular word, know, in the original language, there are several different words for the word know, translated know, in our English Bibles out of the Greek. This particular word is not the word that I used last time. I thought it was the word, the the Greek word gnosko, which is translated several different places in God's word to know. That is an experiential kind of knowledge. When John says, let me just back up just a little bit here. His gospel, you're familiar with John's gospel, the gospel of John. It's the fourth gospel, okay? Um, in that particular book, John wrote specifically to unbelievers. The theme of the, the gospel of John can be found in John 20, 31, which says these are written, and he's talking about the entire gospel. These are written that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And that, or that ye, well, let's look at it, rather than me try and stumble through it. Um, Let's look at John 20 and verse 31, which says, But these are written that ye may believe, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. That's the, that's the theme of the entire book of John. And John's desire for the unbelievers who read his gospel is that they would come to understand, they might read about God's Son, believe in Him, and receive eternal life through faith. Now, his epistle, which is 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, we're talking about 1st John 5 and verse 13 to begin with, or specifically, um, his epistle was written for believers, okay? Was written for believers and his desire for them is not that they might believe and receive the gospel, but that having believed, they may know that they have received eternal life. That's the, that's the difference, okay? And when he says that ye may know, okay? Now, let's, look, look at this. Look at the way this is written. He says, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Okay? Who is that? He's talking to Christian people. Okay? And here's what he wants them to know. What is it that he wants them to know? That you have eternal life. Okay? Now, that particular word um, that he uses for that is translated know that ye may know that ye have eternal life is not the word that I thought it was. It's not the word gnosko, which is, an, it is a knowledge, but it is based on experience over time, okay? How many of you have ever worked with somebody for a period of time, period of years, lived next door to them, and over the years you got to know them. That's the kind of knowledge that we're talking about, gnosko, uh, it, it, it means. This particular word is the word oida, which is certainly different, but it is the knowledge, it means to know with a settled knowledge. 
I know that I am on my way to heaven, that I have eternal life. That's settled, and it's based on God's word. What does God say? You go back to John's gospel, three, six, John 3.16. Brother Tim mentioned they were memorizing John 3.16. What does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay? When somebody does that, can they know, have it settled in their heart, in their head, in their life, that they have eternal life? Can they know that? The answer to the question is yes. And one of the reasons you could answer in the affirmative that you can know that it's settled, okay? You don't have to doubt. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to think so, maybe so, hope so. I can know that I have eternal life. God's word says that. God's word in, in, in John three sixteen, Jesus is speaking, and oh, by the way, who is he? He's God. Can God lie? Has God ever lied? No. Will God ever lie? Okay. If that's settled, then what God said in John 3.16, somebody can, and, and somebody does that, they believe in the Son, on the Son, what do they get? What does the verse say? It says eternal life. And if I've done that, and I've taken God at his word, I can know that. It's settled, period. End of story, mic drop. I don't have to worry about it or anything. It's just like this. There's another circumstance. You've heard me talk about it. How do, how do you know? I had a professor ask us, how do you know you're called into the ministry? And it's, to me, it's settled. It is that oida type understanding. It means to know with a settled knowledge. I know that in March of 1985, sitting on the front pew on would be stage right, so to speak, of the auditorium, of a little church outside Columbus, Indiana, at the funeral of my grandpa Arbuckle, I know I got called into the ministry. It's settled with me. I know that. Nobody's going to change my mind. You can argue all you want to. I know that. That's the kind of knowledge that we're talking about. And John mentions, as he's writing to believers, in this epistle that ye may know with a settled understanding based on God's word that you have what? Eternal, Eternal life. And why I'm, I'm hammering on it a little bit because it's very important, as I mentioned, you may only have just a few minutes. You may only have maybe a, you know, um, a, 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 lunch, a lunch break. 30 minutes or so, okay, to talk to somebody about their salvation. Maybe it's developed, this, this process has gone on for a while. Uh, we're going to be uh, giving you an update on a young lady that's on our prayer list now. Uh, she lives up in the Hudson, Ohio area. A friend of mine asked me to continue to pray. Um, they've been uh, praying for this young lady for many, many months. And she's been coming to church, and they've been talking to her about her salvation and so forth. And, and it, it may be that that process of you being a testimony, you being an effective witness, an effective proclaimer of the Word of God may take some time. But when, when and if, if and when, you, they, they come to a point where they're, they're, they know they need to be saved, they're ready to do that, you need to make sure before you leave them that they understand 
when they put their faith in Christ, guess what happens? What do they get? They get eternal life. Now, does that mean that they have to do something afterward to keep it? No. No. It's settled. Okay? And it's, it's very important for us to, rather than, than leave them with a, you know, and they may end up having, a, like you mentioned, a head knowledge. Okay? Um, I've had people come to me that, quite honestly, I thought I led them to the Lord. They, they would even tell me, hey, I thought, I, thought it was, I, th- I thought I got saved on that particular time. Do you remember that pastor? Yes, I do. But it, it, it occurred to me that what I had was a head knowledge and it didn't have it in my heart. Okay? So uh, we need to really make sure because, it, believe it or not, it, it, it has to be. It has to be a miserable existence. If you think you might be possibly maybe saved, but you're not sure. Because you're always going to wonder, aren't you? And my, my, my uh, encouragement to anybody that's in that, in, in that state would be, okay, let's just make sure. Let's just get this, let's get this thing settled. Okay, I don't care what it doesn't matter to me what your past might have been, whether you. okay, uh, I I know some college students. I gave one illustration years ago. A young man was raised in a Christian home, raised in Christian school. He was the chaplain of his society at Bob Jones University. He thought for sure that he was saved 100 percent. He could give you chapter and verse. But he had a head knowledge and not a heart knowledge. And he'd been playing games. And you want to make sure that they are, they get that assurance. Let's go on a little bit further. Let's take a little bit of time here and look at what next. Okay, what comes after? Somebody gets saved, somebody's born again. Uh, What are they? What do we call them? They're a something in Christ. Babe. They're a babe, okay? Babies take time to grow, right? Um, Second Peter, turn a page or two over uh, in, your, in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3. Look at verse number 18. Peter says, the last verse of this second epistle of Peter, he says, but grow in grace... And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So grow, okay? Once somebody's saved, you want to make sure that they start growing as a Christian. And there are several different activities, if you want to call them that that they would go through that would help them that you could suggest maybe you uh, set up some time let's just suppose you led somebody to the Lord they, maybe it was that they called you uh, up whenever it was sometime in the evening and you've been dealing with them and you've been praying with them and praying for them and and they finally come to a point where hey look I, I need to get saved can you come over and you go over there and Well, let me ask, let me throw this out there. Would you do that? If somebody called you when you get home tonight at 8, 830, whenever it is, they call you, you're getting ready to go to, you know, bed because you got to work tomorrow or something, 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 whatever. And they called you and they said, I really need to get saved. Can you come over? What would you do? I would hope you would go. Okay. Now that that could that that could work out into wee hours of the morning. Been there, done that. Okay. But if there's pie and coffee, it's even better, right? No, I'm just joking. I shouldn't joke about that kind of thing. But before you leave them, you need to make sure that one, they have assurance of their salvation, and number two, okay, you want to help them grow. 
So what's one of the first things, one of the things that you can do to encourage somebody who's been saved, who has that, I know that, it's settled, I'm on my way to heaven, I've received God's gift of eternal life, now what? Now what do I do? Okay, well, um, 1 Peter chapter 2, turn a few pages over from 2 Peter, growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 2 Peter he says, wherefore, laying aside all malice and guile, uh, f- uh, 1, Peter, uh, 2, 1 Peter 2 and verse number 1. says, wherefore, laying aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word. What's the last part of the verse there in 1 Peter 2, 2? that you may grow thereby. One of the things you really want to begin to encourage them to do is to read God's word. Now, question, where do you take them? Where do you want them to start? Where do you suggest? Probably the gospels, okay? uh, a, a, maybe a good place to start uh, would be the Gospel of Mark because it's short, okay? It's the shortest of the Gospels, okay? Um, maybe it is that you want to take them, um, you, you want to maybe take them to, um, you could talk, take them to Genesis, okay? But by the time they get to Leviticus, okay? <laughs> You get to take them to Leviticus or Deuteronomy or Numbers, okay? They're going to be going, man, I don't think I signed up for this, right? Maybe it is you want to take them to just Genesis, okay? Because there's a possibility here in our country that maybe as a kid they did go to Sunday school. Or they went to vacation Bible school or something like that, and they're familiar with some of those stories, but you want to get them in the Gospels um, or in the Word of God at least uh, to begin reading and, and, and studying and so on. And, and that, that might mean for you, spiritual mom, spiritual dad, that you're going to have to schedule some time to <clears throat> do something that we in the church Fundamental Baptist churches like Harborside Baptist Church and others called discipleship. Okay? And you might come to me and you might go, Pastor, led this guy to the Lord and he's right here or something and maybe bring him to church and that's, that's the, uh, another thing. Uh, but you want to, you, you know, you, you, you want to get them if they don't have a Bible Get them a Bible. They're, you, you can buy them at a gas station, okay? Uh, they're not that expensive. Um, but get them studying and reading the Word of God. That's vitally important. Secondly, you want to teach them, you want to teach them how to pray, okay? You want to teach them how to pray. Look at Hebrews just a little further uh, in, your, in your Bibles. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Hebrews 4, 14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest, who is that? Jesus. Jesus. That is passed into the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore, because we have an advocate, we have a high priest who knows, okay, All about our infirmities, our our difficulties, our problems, our temptations, and so forth, okay? 
we can come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Teach them how to pray. And you say, well, I don't know how to pray myself. Well, surely you've had conversations with people over the course of your lifetime. Praying is a conversation. It's a little bit more than that. Um, it, it, it's actually a, um, a, a, an act of worship, an act of reverence. Um, but you can teach them how to pray, talk to the Lord. Maybe it is that, that that's a good, you, you know, a good Bible study. Paul says in Thessalonians that we should pray how? Fervently. Fervently. Pray without ceasing, okay? Maybe you take them to that verse and you'll memorize those verses together and they say, well, what does that mean? Does that mean that I got, that's the only conversation I have is with the Lord is all day and without ceasing? And I, how am I going to get some rest? How am I going to get anything done? How am I going to get laundry, cook for, for you know, the kids and get them off to school? How am, how am I going to do that if I'm praying without ceasing? Well, then you've got to teach them what that means, Right? But you get them studying the Word of God, praying, okay? Secondly, how about this one? Hebrews chapter 10. And I would hope that you would do this if, if they live in our area, okay? Now, granted, uh, if you go down to, you know, maybe you're on vacation or something like that, and you happen to lead somebody to the Lord um, while you're away on vacation, um, it's probably not going to happen, although you might invite them. Anytime you're up in Marietta, Ohio, 501 Virginia Street is where I go to church. I'm sure our pastor would love to see you, okay? They're probably not going to be coming from, you know, Myrtle Beach, if that happens to be where you're on vacation, all the way up here on the weekends to go to church here, okay? But church membership, certainly church attendance is something that you need to get them to understand as well. And God's word says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching, okay? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. What does a baby need to grow? He needs nourishment. Okay, how does a baby Christian get nourishment? Where does it come from? What do they feast on? The word of God, okay? Read your Bible, pray every day, grow, grow, grow. That little song, okay? Um, but babies generally, well, no, I won't say generally. Babies need somebody to feed them, right? Till they learn to feed themselves, okay? And babies need care, right? And granted, where they get the care from, mom and dad and so forth. But a baby Christian is going to be cared for, not just by hopefully you, okay, who birthed this baby into the kingdom, but by a group of fellow believers brothers and sisters in Christ who can pray for them, be an encouragement to them. Maybe it is that, um, you know, you, you, you're only going to bring them along, or maybe it is that um, your, your understanding and, and as you're growing in the Lord, um, maybe there's going to come uh, somebody that will, okay, you, you kind of hand that person off to them in that discipleship process. But church attendance certainly is very, very vital that they, because it's, it's a, there, there's that, the corporate worship, there's the uh, kind of the protection as far as being prayed for and, and, and so forth. We're going to mention something here in an update here that a friend of mine undoubtedly would, would like for us to pray for this <coughs> Uh, person that the Lord would build a hedge of protection around this person, okay? And the more of us that are doing that, I'm not saying that one person is not adequate to, to get to God's ear, but when 
somebody is encouraging you, that's great to have one person. But if you come to a place where everybody is encouraging you, that's even better. So church attendance is, is a great thing. Christian fellowship and friendship, certainly. Okay, that's another, another, another reason um, uh, to get them plugged into a you know, good Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. Uh, what about, and again, this kind of goes all together, uh, Christian counsel, okay? Um, that's, that's one of the reasons why there are pastors. It's one of the reasons why there are deacons. That's one of the reasons why there are um, older, I'll say, older in the Lord saints, okay? People that have been a Christian for a period of time, and maybe, maybe it is they've been to a Bible institute. Maybe it is they've been to, you know, been to Bible college. Maybe it is they've, you know, just in their study, they, they, they've been through, um, you know, the Sunday school quarterlies and all that. They understand the Bible and they've been to a good church and that kind of thing, been taught and, and whatnot. So um, you, you certainly need to, to make that available to this particular person and also, as they grow, we need to, and let's go back to 1 Peter. Verse number, or chapter 4, 1 Peter 4, and verse number 10. First Peter 4.10 says, as every man hath received the gift. What's, what's the gift we're talking about? Salvation. Well, that could be, uh, but most probably what he's talking about is each one of us has a gift of some sort. Okay. Um, Paul talks about them in Romans. He talks about them in 1 Corinthians. He talks about gifts of service, gifts of... Well, this is one, one of the things, let me just throw this out there. One of the things that I've come to know about my wife, okay, this is that Gnidso, Gnodsko uh, type over time experience, knowledge that I have of my wife. You want me to tell you how my wife serves? My wife serves with her apron. she likes to do that there are times when I've seen her she'll come home from work you know it's an hour there an hour back and 12 hours in between and she'll come home and she'll say I'm gonna make brownies and, and no one's ever called me about that. <laughs> nobody calls you for brownies brother okay oh, okay okay I got you I understand but she does that. She has that, that gift of service. It's not a gift of making brownies, okay? She does a lot of different things, but that's one of the things she serves. That's how she serves. That's how one of her gifts, okay? Um, uh, so, you know, some gifts are, 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 are not just that, but there are a variety of others, other, other gifts out there, okay? And... Um, Christian service certainly is one of those things that you want to get that baby after they mature for a period of time, okay? And, and, and they'll, they'll let you know when they're ready for that because they'll come to you and say, they might come to me as the pastor and say, I really want to do, I want to do something. What can I do? Okay? We'll find something, and they can serve. But you want to be very, very concerned about their assurance because the Bible says, and this is based on God's word, not what Pastor Don Arbuckle says, okay? Not what Harborside Baptist Church believes, not what Bob Jones University ascribes to or anything like that or any you know denomination might say. It's based on the word of God. God's word says... You can know that you have eternal life. You can know that. It's settled. 
You want to make sure that they're settled with that. Because if they're not, what's going to happen when difficulty comes? And, and it will, it will, okay? Satan can't change their eternal destination, but he can get them stopped in their maturity. He can get them stopped in their tracks. Read the, 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 the first book of Corinthians. And what is, who is Paul talking to? He's talking to a whole bunch of baby Christians who should know better, who should have grown to maturity and been reproducing and for whatever reason they didn't, okay? It, it happens certainly, but it, that you, you, can, you, you can minimize that possibility if you get them to understand their assurance and then also get them growing in the Lord. And that's vitally important for, for us as Christians, individually, corporately as a church, to make sure that people have the assurance of their salvation and then are growing in the Lord. So they too can go on to do what? They can see others. Okay, think about this for just a second. Let's say you lead somebody to the Lord, okay? And... You disciple them or get them plugged in to a a church where they can be discipled and they're growing in the Lord and they go on to do the same thing, okay? You can go on to do the same thing. And those people go on to do the same thing. And those people go on to do the same thing. And and on and on and on and on and on it goes, okay? That's that's uh, a wonderful way to see the church grow is when people take the gospel, win others to Christ, disciple them so they can go on and do the same thing, and you go on to do the same thing, and they go on and we go on to do the same thing. Any questions, comments real quickly? All right, well, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll take some prayer requests, take some updates as well, have our prayer time. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to look into your word, and we thank you for the assurance that we can have of our salvation. We thank you, Lord, for, again, those that cared enough about us to pray for us and show us from your word how to be saved. And we thank you for the opportunity that we have as Christians to do the same for others. And we would pray that you would help us, Lord. We have several people on our prayer list that we're praying about their salvation. Prayer certainly is a wonderful component of that. But one thing that we certainly need to do is maybe maybe we need to set up a time where we go talk to these people, just show up at their house and just ask them some questions about their salvation, show them quite possibly um, how to be saved. Maybe it is that they're ready and we don't know it. And Lord, we would pray that you would help us to to use discretion there, uh, to do what we can to see souls saved and lives changed. We ask your blessings on our prayer time now in Jesus' name. Amen.